Thanks for coming today. This is uh, part of the Authors at Google series. I'm happy to introduce uh, Leslie Berlin. She's the author of The Man Behind the Microchip, which is uh, the book that you all uh, can see at the chairs. Um, I think this talk's going to be really relevant to Google, and also I'm sure some of you will have personal careers and histories that uh, interact pretty closely with uh, her work. Uh, just to give you a quick background, she um, has a PhD in history from Stanford. And she's currently working as a project historian for the Silicon Valley Archives, which is um, part of the Stanford uh, University Department of Special Collections. She also is a visiting scholar, and she's working on the history and philosophy of science and technology at Stanford. Um, um, she will follow her talk with a Q&A, so feel free to share or uh, ask any questions you might have. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them. So um, I will turn it over to Leslie Berlin. Thanks very much, and thanks for having me. I'll try to talk loudly um, and hope you can hear me. I'm really excited to have this chance to talk to you about Bob Noyce and about my book, The Man Behind the Microchip. When Noyce was alive, he was called the Thomas Edison and the Henry Ford of Silicon Valley. Thomas Edison for his invention of the integrated circuit, which lies at the heart of modern electronics. And he was called Henry Ford because he was one of the founders of two different companies. The first was Fairchild Semiconductor, which was the first successful silicon company in Silicon Valley. And the second was Intel, which is today the largest microchip company in the world. On top of this, Bob Noyce was a daredevil. He had a patch on his ski jacket that said, no guts, no glory. And this was absolutely a fitting motto for this guy who piloted his own jets, one time just took one through a baby thunderhead cloud, just, just to see what that was like. He was the kind of guy who loved to have helicopters drop him at the top of mountaintops so he could ski his way down with a transponder clipped to his jacket in case he got lost. And it was this combination of risk taking and inventiveness and business success that really made Noyce seem the embodiment of Silicon Valley and high technology. But in the years since his death in 1990, Noyce's memory, Noyce's name has really faded from people's memories. I'm hoping that my book will do something to reverse that because I've studied the history of Silicon Valley for about 10 years at this point. And the more I've studied, the more I've become convinced that Bob Noyce is just too important to be forgotten. And the person who reminded me of this, interestingly enough, was actually Steve Jobs. He said to me, you cannot understand what is happening today without understanding what came before. And Bob Noyce is just an essential part of what came before. So in about the next half hour or so, I'm going to talk, just share with you some of my favorite scenes from the book. This isn't comprehensive, the book, I mean, you can see in front of you, it's, it's a bit of a tome, you know, 300 pages and then 100 pages of notes. Um, these are really just some of my favorite pictures and favorite stories. So here we go. So this is Bob Noyce as a baby. Uh, he was born in December of 1927 in Burlington, Iowa. And he's seated between his two brothers. That's Don, his brother on the left and Gaylord, his brother, on the right. There's a fourth brother who is, obviously isn't shown. You can see that the little boy's hands are clasped in prayer. And my guess is that their mother, Harriet, made them do that. She was this dynamic, wonderful woman who had always wanted to be a missionary. And she had this extremely strong personality. She would have made an excellent missionary, very articulate, very devout. Um, and her father and her grandfather had both been Congregationalist ministers. And then she went and married another Congregationalist minister who is the father of these boys. And just to give you a sense of the family that these kids were born into, this, this family's Midwestern roots go way back. The mom was from Chicago. The dad was from Nebraska. Noyce lived in Iowa until he graduated from college. And on both sides of the family, the boys, the, the, all of the adults had been either ministers, teachers, or both. And if you look at these three boys, two of them followed the pattern. 
Don ended up on the left, ended up becoming a professor of chemistry at Cal Berkeley. He was chair of the department for quite a while. And his brother Gaylord on the right uh, became a Congregationalist minister, taught at Yale Divinity School, went on the Freedom Rides, was friends with Martin Luther King Jr. As a very accomplished family, um, in particularly in these two fields, Noyce always said that he fell into business by accident. He wasn't really quite sure how it happened. And this family, too, had very, very high expectations of their children. Both of the parents had gone to college, but more incredibly to me, all four of the grandparents, at a time when 2% of the population had college degrees, all four of these boys' grandparents who were Midwestern people from farm towns, not East Coast elite, all of them had gone to college. And the parents really tried to encourage inventiveness and creativity in these boys. They would do things like deliberately leave an encyclopedia, a set of encyclopedias on a low shelf, hoping that the boys would uh, get a chance to read them. I was thinking, thanks, thanks to Google, that's not too many people are going to have encyclopedias in their houses anymore to do that. But that encyclopedia really came into play about 12 years later when the boys decided to build a glider. This picture was taken in the summer of 1940 in Grinnell, Iowa. This is Bob. He's sitting on your left, and that's his brother Gaylord with his arm raised. Bob is 12. Gaylord is 14. They're sitting with a glider that they built. And to give you a sense of scale, the wingspan on this glider was about 18 feet. It was something that they built completely on their own. They didn't have any blueprints. They didn't have any help from grown-ups. They didn't have any learn to build a glider summer camps or anything like that happening. They went strictly from their own experience building model airplanes and from a picture that they saw in this encyclopedia set. They figured if we can build little airplanes, we can build big airplanes. Now, this plane was absolutely the highlight of the summer for these Noyce brothers, but also, for as near as I can tell, anyone who lived in the town of Grinnell, Iowa, at the time they were growing up. When I went to Grinnell to do some research, people would just come out of the woodwork telling me just these incredible stories about the glider, about 5% of which turned out to be true. But there were 17 kids on the block, and these, the noises managed to help to marshal their talents in the service of this glider. So you had the boy whose father owned a furniture store. He had rugs come on these long spindles. And the boy talked his dad into giving them the spindles, and that's what made the frame of the plane. Of course, the one girl on the block was the person assigned to sew the cheesecloth that they stretched over the wings. And then the boy on the block who was 16 years old, newly possessed of his driver's license, was asked to tie the pl this glider to the back of his car and take off down the street to see if they could get some air and pull it behind like a kite, uh, which they actually managed to do. But to Noyce, the real mark of success would be if he could, as he put it, jump off the roof of a barn and live. So that's actually what he did. He climbed up on the roof of this barn that you see here, had somebody hand him the glider. He took a, a deep breath and ran right off the edge of the roof into the unknown. And he landed without crashing and considered it absolutely a great success. Now. If I were a fiction writer, I would have made up this story about the glider because it foreshadows so much of what made Bob Noyce a successful leader in the tech field. First, you have here his real ability to tinker. He could build anything with his hands. He had immediate credibility with people because he was the sort of guy who would blow his own glass if he needed to have it for use in a lab. Secondly, you see his ability to round up a team and have each person contribute his or her own special talent uh, to making a project go. And third, from the scale of this project, you can see that Bob Noyce was a person with absolutely no sense of limits. He was the kind of guy who really believed that if you wanted to fly, you needed to start running off 
of a rooftop and not stop when you got to the edge. This made him a fantastic leader because he never had any sense that there was anything that you shouldn't be able to do. And he would manage to inspire people to join him in that effort. So now we're going to go to a black slide. It has no deep significance. It's just a transitional slide. Um, so imagine we're fast forwarding about 17 years. Uh, Noyce grows up. He goes to college at Grinnell College, where he gets a double major in math and physics. He goes on, gets a PhD at MIT in physical electronics, which was about as close as you could get to semiconductor physics at the time. He gets married. He goes, works for a year in Philadelphia at Philco. And then he gets um, a call from a man named William Shockley, asking him to come here to this area, the San Francisco Bay Area, to work. Noyce said getting a call from William Shockley was like picking up the phone and talking to God. Shockley was absolutely the most important guy in semiconductors. He was one of three inventors of the transistor, and he had decided to set off and start his own company to build transistors. He built around him an absolute dream team of researchers from all over the United States. He, and the, the effort he went to to find these people is absolutely monumental. I mean, he visited all these college campuses, called people, went to conferences, really trying to find what he called hot minds in semiconductor research. So Noyce was one of these hot minds. And Shockley had a real interest in psychological testing. So in order to ensure that his team was not only brilliant but able to work together well, he subjected them all to psychological tests with you know, Rorschach tests, these sorts of things. And you know, it actually worked. The team worked together beautifully. But Shockley's one oversight was that he did not have them tested for psychological compatibility with him. And that actually turned out to be quite a problem. William Shockley was a micromanager down to the level of specifying the kind of screws that he wanted used in certain pieces of equipment and even more upsetting to the guys who'd come to work on transistors with the inventor of the transistor, he decided he really didn't care about building transistors. He wanted to build something called a four-layer diode, which was a kind of cool idea, but there wasn't really a market for it. And so in September of 1957, a group of seven guys decided that they were going to leave and start their own company. And they talked noise into joining them. And so on the appointed day, they climb into two of their wives' station wagons, just squeezed in shoulder to shoulder, and make the drive up the coast, to, up, up the peninsula to San Francisco, where they are slated to meet with two bankers in the Redwood Room of the Clift Hotel, a very, very swanky place at the time. Now waiting there for them are these two bankers. One's name is Bud Coyle. And with him, too, is his junior associate, a guy named Arthur Rock, who I'm sure many of you know as the venture capitalist behind Intel, behind Apple. At this point, he was just a young pup. So they, they talk for a while. They, re they decide, yeah, we think we can probably start a company together. It turned out to be much harder than they had ever imagined. They went to something like 30 different companies trying to get backing. No one wanted to take a chance on this group of inexperienced guys. At this, once they'd made their decision, Bud Coyle pulled out of his briefcase 10 crisp $1 bills, and he said, each of us should sign every one. These bills will be our contracts with each other. And this, looking at this bill ought to give you a real sense of what I'm talking about when I say William Shockley assembled a dream team. If you start in the upper right-hand corner, that's Gordon Moore's signature, recruited by Shockley. Underneath him is Jean Herny, who invented the planar process. Um, under him is Art Rock, who we just talked about. Coming to the left, that's Eugene Kleiner of Kleiner Perkins on the bottom left. Uh, above him is Noyce. And then above Noyce are Jay Last, Sheldon Roberts, Julius Blank, and Vic Greenwich, who were four key components to the whole effort to bring um, the integrated circuit to life. And then you have Bud Coyle's signature there. So really, I mean, this was a remarkable group of people. And to me, um, as a historian, 
this was a remarkable thing to find. And the reason that I wanted to show it to you also is that no one had ever seen this before. I published the picture in my book, <clears throat> excuse me, other than the 10 guys whose names are on it. And the way I found it, this is the serendipity of historical research, was I was interviewing one of these founders. I walked down his hallway following him to some room. And on the wall, I noticed a dollar bill. And I thought to myself, I didn't know this guy started a restaurant, which was really the only time I've ever seen a framed dollar bill in my life. Um, I asked him about it. He, he told me the story that I just told you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I confirmed this story with several of the other founders, all of whom had told me stories of starting Fairchild Semiconductor, none of which mentioned this dollar bill. They all said, Oh, yeah, yeah, my dollar bill, I've got it in my, you know, I mean, just places that just makes you sick as a historian. Oh, I've got it wadded up in a, you know, corner somewhere in my billfold, whatever. Um, and while they were so casual about this, they weren't hiding anything. They just didn't think it was very interesting. I was having heart palpitations because this, if Fairchild Semiconductor is the company that put the silicon in Silicon Valley, this is like finding the Magna Carta of Silicon Valley hanging on the wall of someone's house in Portland, Oregon. So for me, it was just a very exciting thing to find. And as an aside, I just wanted to tell you um, that a lot of this nonchalance that these guys express towards their own history is very common among technologists who spend their lives focused on the future. And part of what I'm doing now at Stanford is trying to recapture some of the documents from the founding years of Silicon Valley that are just moldering away or else they've been destroyed. Um, I'm happy to talk with you about that during Q&A if that's something you're interested in. This is what the guys looked like at the time that they started the company. They were, uh, I think two of them were over 30, but barely. Um, this is Noyce um, with his arm thrust over the chair front and center, as was always the case with Bob Noyce. Uh, directly across the umbrella stick from him is Eugene Kleiner of Kleiner Perkins. And then to Gene's left, your right, um, is Gordon Moore. Uh, I wanted to show you this picture in part because I wanted to point out the umbrella, which sounds sort of funny. Um, it was very, very hard to get people to move to the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1950s to work for a high-tech company. It, this place was known for its orchards. It was not known to, for high-tech. And these guys were only known as the crazy people who decided that they were too good to work for William Shockley, who then went and won the Nobel Prize for physics. Um, they were considered rebels in a very negative way. Uh, they were warned that they would never work in this town again because they had left someone's job. They had left set jobs to go and start their own companies. So these guys pulled out all the stops to try to get people to come here. One thing that they made a big deal about was the weather. And this, with the sunshine and the, and the umbrella was actually their Christmas card, which they sent to people on the East Coast with great glee, trying to show what you could do if you would come to California. Um, they also, they talked about the great clean air here, uh, how good the schools are. And, and my personal favorite, um, which when I read about with Bob Noyce just cracked me up, he had been living in the heart of Philadelphia. When he wanted to move here, his wife didn't. But the way that he convinced her to come was that, you know, they could afford to buy a house in the San Francisco Bay Area. And in the heart of Philadelphia, it was they could just afford an apartment. So the low cost of living was another really big sales point in the late 1950s. So Noyce's first job at Fairchild Semiconductor was heading R&D. Uh, this was an incredibly intellectually fertile time in his life. In the first 18 months that he was at Fairchild, he, he filed for seven patents that he received. And the seven of his 17 came from this one window of time. He was just sort of on fire intellectually. Uh, the key one is this one, which is for what we would today call the integrated circuit. Now, Usually when I'm not talking to tech audiences, I'll sort of go in and explain how any electronic device with an on-off switch pretty much at this point runs on integrated circuit technology. Um, 
this cell phones, this sort of thing, and even things that people don't think about, like their cars have just an incredible number of these circuits, I mean, on, on the order of millions inside of their cars, uh, helping to run these things. At the same time that Noyce was coming up with his ideas, Jack Kilby in uh, Texas, working for Texas Instruments, independently came up with his own set of ideas. They are considered co-inventors of the integrated circuit. Now, by the time this patent was filed, Noyce was no longer working in the lab. Essentially, what happened was right after he sketched out his ideas for the integrated circuit, a general manager whom the group of eight had hired to run the company for them did unto them what they had done unto Shockley. And he up and left and started his own semiconductor company. Uh, the other seven lobbied hard for Noyce to become general manager. He really did not want this job. He was trained as a lab scientist. He was on an intellectual role. He knew nothing, I mean nothing, about business. And he agreed to take the job for six months, during which time he said that he, he was very happy to discover that people would do what he said, not because they liked him, but because he ha they had to. And this, to him, was just sort of a great thing. And he decided to go ahead and stay as general manager. <clears throat> he managed to teach himself quite a bit by 10 years after Fairchild Semiconductor was founded, the company had 11,000 employees and $12 million in profits. In a lot of ways, it was the Google of its time. It was, in 1967, the fastest growing stock on Wall Street. Was, there were sort of frenzied people trying to get in on it. And um, all of this happened under Noyce's leadership. Now, in night, what happened, though, was Fairchild got very, very big. Noyce was from a small town. Noyce always said that he was not able to manage large companies well, which is true. Which is, but he learned it by not managing Fairchild Semiconductor very well um, when, he, when his second in command, Charlie Spork, left in 1967. The company's profits actually dropped 96% in one year, uh, which was a little bit of a problem. Uh, also, the company had been acquired, and Noyce felt very much like he wasn't being given the kind of autonomy and authority. He needed to run it the way he wanted to. There was particular friction over stock options. The company that had acquired Fairchild Semiconductor was called Fairchild Camera and Instrument. It was very steeped in East Coast tradition of Sherman Fairchild's father was uh, the largest shareholder in IBM. Um, no, sorry, Sherman himself was the largest shareholder in IBM because Thomas Watson had a couple of kids, and Sherman Fairchild's father, who had been a partner with Tom Watson, only had Sherman, so Sherman became the largest shareholder. He had very old-fashioned ideas, one of which was that stock options were, in his words, creeping socialism. And this was actually a real problem uh, for Noyce. Um, they were at almost constant loggerheads. So in 1968, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore decided to leave and start their own company to build semiconductor memories, actually, not microprocessors. They started out as a memory company. Uh, Gordon told me that he'll never forget that he left on July 3rd, 1968, because payroll wouldn't pay him for the July 4th holiday. Um, so. Noyce's mantra here was small, small, small. He wanted a small company. Obviously, Intel did not stay small uh, for very long. There was a young uh, research scientist who came up to Gordon when he heard Gordon was leaving and say, said, take me with you. I want to do, uh, I want to follow you, basically. That young research scientist was Andy Grove. He uh, joined Noyce and Moore in the office of the president quite quickly. And this picture, in case the ties didn't clue you in, was taken in the 1970s, uh, 1978 to be exact. And I wanted to show you this, Intel, this is Intel's 10th anniversary. I wanted to show you this because I thought you in particular would be interested in knowing how it was that Intel worked the whole notion of an office of the president, particularly when the company was young. So uh, Noyce, who's in the middle there, was generally called Mr. Outside. 
Moore, Gordon, well, you know Gordon Moore. He's on Noyce's left, your right. Um, Gordon was called Mr. Inside, and Andy with the luxurious mustache was, was called Mr. Implementation in the beginning. This was just how people generally knew them. Noyce's job was to deal with the press, with customers, with the board, later with the government. Grove's job was to keep the line running. He was very he was in charge of all of the day-to-day -day detail work that Noyce was so bad at and that Grove was so good at keeping track of. And then Gordon Moore's job was to balance these sort of signals that Noyce was reaving, receiving from the outside with the sig signals that Andy was bringing in from the inside and then kind of lay all that out against advances in the field uh, in in science and technology. Uh, and so their, their differences just complemented each other perfectly. Their roles definitely evolved. The way that they handled innovation at Intel um, early on among these three I thought was very interesting too. Noyce was always the sort of idea man. He, he would say, you know, someday we're going to be able to use microprocessors or circuits or in some sort some idea that seemed as bizarre as I'm 12 years old I can build an 18 foot glider so almost a decade before anyone was putting microprocessors into cars Noyce was saying we need to be looking at the automotive market in the 60s he was talking about how someday we'd have what is essentially cruise control pagers this sort of thing so Noyce would sort of come up with some big idea like this and then Gordon would say well gosh you know in order for us to be able to do that, we're going to have to transcend these sort of technical problems A and B. And then Grove's job was to say, well, my god, to do that, we're going to have to hire X number more employees and get Y amount of plant space under our belts. So it was just a very, very fruitful sort of collaboration. Now, most stories about Bob Noyce tend to end right here. You, you get him. Uh, at Fair, he starts Fairchild, he invents the integrated circuit, he starts Intel, and then you don't hear anything else about him. But the fact is that Noyce lived for another 15 years after he moved to the chairmanship of Intel in 1975. And I was really excited to see that this part of Noyce's life was as interesting as the time that came before it. So he basically split his work for the last 15 years of his life into two parts. First part was that he worked on behalf of the American semiconductor industry to counter the threat from Japanese firms that were selling chips that were as good as the American chips but being sold a lot less expensively. The the concern in the 1980s over the Japanese semiconductor industry makes the concerns that you hear today about China and India and the sort of competitive advantages or disadvantages that the United States has relative to them, it makes those look like little baby concerns. I had several people I spoke to tell me that during the 1980s, most of the founders of the American semiconductor industry were fairly certain that their, their industry was going to cease to exist in the United States. So Noyce and four other execs started something called the Semiconductor Industry Association, which is a very interesting little thing to find out about. Um, it was a, a lobbying group, and it's arguably the most successful lobbying group that anyone, any industry tr trade group has ever put together. Um, so it was surprisingly interesting to learn about that. He was also the founding CEO of Semitech. That's where this picture was taken. Semitech. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Um, Semitech was a huge kludge, actually. It was 14 American semiconductor manufacturers plus the Department of Defense, all supposed to collaborate together on improving American semiconductor manufacturing technology. It was a, it was a big job. Noyce took this job out of a sense of duty and a sense of fear. He said he didn't want to see his life's work go up in smoke. The other job he did, the other way he split his time, was something he did out of a sense of love. He mentored young entrepreneurs who were starting their own companies. He called this work restocking the stream I fished from. So this is Bob Noyce and Steve Jobs in the late 1970s. 
Steve Jobs said to me, Bob Noyce took me under his wing. He tried to give me a perspective that I could only partially understand. Now, there's several Noyce Jobs stories in the book. I just want to tell you my favorite, which is that Bob Noyce had an airplane called a CB. Now, the CB can land on water or it could land on land. So Bob invited Steve Jobs to come with him for a trip in his CB. They were going to fly up near Tahoe. So they, they flew up. They landed um, on a lake. You know, isn't this cool? Bob says to Steve, they take off again. Unbeknownst to either of them, Noyce inadvertently locked the wheels into water landing position instead of tarmac landing position, which they only discovered when they went to land on a runway. And Jobs described, he said, you know, we hit the ground so hard, we started bouncing like crazy. There were these sparks absolutely shooting past the window, and Noyce is furiously trying to control the steering wheel. Jobs talks about his knuckles just being so white he could barely stand it. And the whole time he's imagining the headline that will run in the papers the next day, Bob Noyce and Steve Jobs killed in fiery plane crash. And it was just this incredibly dramatic moment for him. And as he was telling me this story, I was trying to understand, now what is it about Bob Noyce that... Uh, was so important to him. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that Noyce offered Jobs a sense that this, this sort of, this sense of limitlessness and creativity and vision and passion and this, everything that these two both possessed in such abundance, that this isn't something that you have to give up when you start or run a high-tech company. It can actually be the heart of the company. And this is just my favorite picture of Bob Noyce. I like it that he's wearing his little Intel badge. <clears throat> so Steve Jobs was the most prominent of the entrepreneurs that Noyce worked with. Um, but there, there were dozens of them. And several of them were actually in tears telling me about how much Noyce meant to them. What Bob Noyce did was he gave people confidence in themselves and in their own ideas. He inspired people by the example of his own excellence, and also by his faith in them. Noyce liked to say, don't be encumbered by history. Go off and do something wonderful. And if you could just imagine for a second what it would be like to hear this. If you're a newly hired employee at Intel and you don't know whether you're going to be able to hack it, Maybe you're an entrepreneur setting out for the first time on your own, or maybe you have a couple failures behind you. To have someone of Noyce's stature say to you, you know what, that doesn't matter. What matters is what you do from this point forward, and you can do something wonderful. It was incredibly inspirational to so many people. I can't tell you how many people have told me that Bob Noyce, that when working for Bob Noyce, they did the best work of their lives. I heard this again and again. And I believe it is this sense of bringing the next generation under his wing and of restocking the stream, as he put it, that is as important a contribution Bob Noyce made to Silicon Valley and high technology as starting Fairchild or starting Intel or, for that matter, even inventing the integrated circuit. I actually end the book talking about it, so I'll uh, read you the last paragraph of the book. And it actually mentions Google. Um, there's an informal sort of generational succession in Silicon Valley that places Noyce near the top of the family tree. A few years ago, for example, the founders of Google asked Steve Jobs for advice and mentorship in the same way Jobs had come to Noyce when Apple was young. And even when there is no such explicit tie back to Noyce, even if the latest generation of entrepreneurs do not know his name, his influence endures in a set of ideals that have become an indelible part of American high-tech culture. Knowledge trumps hierarchy. Every idea can be taken farther. New and interesting is better than established and safe. Go for broke or don't go at all. There are countless other influences, of course, but Noyce's vision is embedded deep in the eye of the swirling energy that is Silicon Valley, 
his spirit quietly urging anyone who might listen to go off and do something wonderful. So that's the end of my talk. Thanks. You can contact me through the site. Um, reviews and such are on there too. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have now about noise, about the writing process, about archives at, at Stanford, anything you're interested in hearing about. Yes? Just when, when they originally founded Fairchild, was it called Fairchild then, or did it change when it was acquired? Yes. Um, what, what was Fairchild called when it was first founded? It was called Fairchild Semiconductor. The backing came from the parent, from uh, Fairchild Camera and Instrument, but it was set up as an independent operation so that if it failed, Fairchild Camera and Instrument wasn't going to be in the hole for anything. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, yes, hi. I was wondering if you're researching something else now, somebody else from the Silicon Valley or So what's my next research project? Anyone in the audience who has any excellent ideas for me on next research projects, I would, I would love to hear them. I, I, I really love the Silicon Valley history, and I'd like to do some more of it. Um, so yeah, I'm open for suggestions on that. It doesn't have to be a biography. Yes. Uh, in addition to IC, uh, he had also worked on tunnel diodes. Yes. Yeah. Um, did Noyce also work on the tunnel diode? Yeah. Actually, um, if you go to this site, um, I published an article in IEEE Spectrum, and it's linked to it here. Noyce did do, um, he sort of independently conceived of the tunnel diode, independent of Asaki, Leo Asaki, and about almost the same time. But when he showed his ideas to William Shockley, for whom he was working, William Shockley told him that that was just a bunch of garbage and go throw it. You know, don't worry about it. And Asaki went on to win the Nobel Prize um, for his research. Noyce actually never won the Nobel Prize, although arguably he could have won one there had he actually published his research. Um, and he would have won one undoubtedly for the integrated circuit when Jack Kilby won for the integrated circuit in 2000. But uh, I didn't know this, actually, but the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. And since Noyce had died in 1990, he couldn't receive it, though both the uh, Academy and uh, Kilby himself spoke about how he should have. <laughs>